Yeah, thanks for thanks for uh, for the welcome. Um, as we mentioned, I work for Christians in Sport across uh, South Wales, so I have the joy of spending my days working with those who are involved in competitive and elite sport, um, helping them navigate the pressures of being a Christian in sport, um, or giving sports people an opportunity to hear of the Christian faith and what it looks like for them to be a Christian in sport as well. Um, as mentioned, me and my wife Chloe, we moved to Skewen recently, so part of the Free Mission Church there. Um, and Chloe, my wife, is actually a Morriston girl, I think some of you um, know her and have met her before. Yeah. Um, but today I just thought I'd um, give you a few questions to think about and just chat through something that's been um, on my mind a lot recently. Um, and here's the questions. Are all people of equal value? What would you say to that? Yeah, yeah. How should we view ourselves and others? And does culture decide this, or is there an answer from the Bible? Um, one of the things I've noticed from being involved in the world of sport, from being involved in the world of work, um, and being involved in church, um, that there's a deep down desire in all people to be highly viewed and highly valued by others. We may be aware of it, or may just subconsciously live um, in that culture, but deep down every one of us want to be highly viewed and highly valued by others. And how is this usually achieved? Well, usually it's achieved by what you do and what you have. Our culture has set this kind of scale of how people are viewed and valued based upon what you do or what you have. Status or salary has a huge part to play in it position and possessions. See, the more impressive what you do is, the more you're viewed and valued. The more you have, the more you're viewed and the more you're valued. And um, society has kind of set this culture up that just exists in that way. I was chatting to a friend about this recently and just talking about where does it come from? Where does this subconscious culture come from? That if someone walks in and what they do is really impressive, or they have a lot, the way we treat them will be very different to someone that doesn't do something you're impressed with or doesn't have a lot. It's a culture found in sport, it's a culture found in society, in the workplace, and in the church. So how we answer certain questions shows how we are kind of, yeah, impressed by this culture or show how we respond to this culture. And I'd love to share personal examples with you from sport, from work, from church, um, that show this. As a sports person, if you're in any conversation, very early on you'll be asked this question, who do you play for? And it's an important question, because your answer to that question will determine the view and value that person will place on you. If who you play for is a respectable level and a respectable team, all of a sudden the treatment you will have will be very different to if it's a low level social club. And it shapes us and moulds us. Because I speak to people that have played at high level and don't play at that level anymore. And then when they are asked this question, they said, something in me always wants to tell them who I used to play for. Because if I tell them who I used to play for, they'll view and value me a lot higher than if I tell them who I currently play for. And it's interesting, isn't it, in the world of sport, that you may argue, well, of course, sport is a place where you're going to be valued more for your achievements, you know, who you play for, how much you earn. But why? Why do we place more value on a person that plays high level than someone who plays local social level? Is... Or are all people equally valued? But our culture doesn't seem to shape up with that. Another example, I've just sat on a table and met some new friends. First question asked, when you meet new people or you're spending time with a new group, what do you do? <laughs> or what did you used to do? And again, make no mistake, your answer to that question will determine the view and value that person will place on you. In 2008, I had my first job, actually. 
I started an apprenticeship in the coal mines in Glenith. And then I worked five and a half years in the mining industry altogether. I worked in a pork dash mine up the northeast of England. When that question was asked during them five and a half years, what do you do? I'd explain. And actually it was responded with respect, mm. with a bit of intrigue, with a lot of follow-up questions. And people made the assumption that I had loads of cash. <laughs> so the treatment you'd have was very different. I left the mines and I went into a rugby contract. Again, when asked that question, there's a lot of kudos from your response and people responded differently. In 2015, I started a Christian internship. What a conversation killer to that question. <laughs> now when you answered what you did, no, no, there was no value in you anymore. People's views of you changed. They made the assumption as soon as they heard Christian job mm. of what kind of person you must be mm. or what kind of beliefs you must hold. Mm. All of a sudden, my value wasn't what it used to be when I shared about what I did. So are all people equal? Well, in the culture we live in, no. Mm. Because in the world of sport, you're not equal. Mm. And in the world of work, you're not equal. See, that question brings nerves to some people. Because they have to say, oh, I don't work, I'm on the sick. Mm. Or oh, I'm a single mom. Mm. Or oh, I'm a stay-at-home dad. Mm. Or oh, I have to make my living doing what people may not think is a worthy living. Mm. But it brings pride if you can say, I'm a professor. Mm. I'm a doctor. I got my own multi-billion mm. company. Mm. So not all people are equal <laughs> in the culture and society mm. that we live in. And the final example is in church. In church, it has its own little microculture. Because if you attend church, you treat it very differently to if you contribute to the cause and purpose of the church. If you hold a leadership position in the church. Again, not all people are seen equally or viewed equally in our cultural setup. So it's something I've been thinking about. Because let's face it, how we view people is fragile. Because it's ultimately based on what they do and what they have. Who they know, what they've achieved, will determine our opinion on them. We're almost trained to do it. Mm. I do it myself and people do it to me. It's a norm. It's a culture that we may not realise existed. Culture tells us not all people are equal. And that's why we can see People are not treated fairly and equal in society. That's why we can cause so much brokenness and harm to one another. Because when we dig deep down, we might say, of course, all people are equal. But in the way society is set up, mm. not all people are viewed equal mm. or treated equal. But what does the Bible say then to these questions? Well, the Bible will say all people are equal because all people are created beings. Mm. The Bible says there's one creator, only one creator, but there's billions of equally yet gifted differently human beings. Mm. On the basis of there being a God that has created all humanity, people are equal. Take God out of the picture, well no, people are not equal. Mm. And then we see what's been outplayed in them questions so how should we view ourselves how should we view others does the bible give a different answer to the way society has shaped us to think well there are many different examples in the bible but i just want to pick up on three stories that jesus told to help us look at this topic jesus speaks of a hundred sheep and he focuses on one he said there was a lost sheep and he speaks about the shepherd searching for that one lost sheep. And when he found it, he rejoiced. He zooms in then and talks about ten coins. And he talks about one coin being lost. And talks about how the coin was searched for. And when it was found, it was rejoiced over. And then he zooms into two sons. And he talks about one son being lost. 
And when the one son came back and was found, there was a massive party and he was rejoiced over. See, the Bible says how we should view ourselves is lost yet loved. These three stories that Jesus told help people understand that actually how you should view yourself is lost yet loved. A sheep, I don't think, would know it's lost. A coin certainly wouldn't. And the story of the two sons said it took a long time for the son to come to his senses and realise he was lost. I don't know if you'd view yourself as someone that's lost. But the Bible would say that's what all humans are. Lost yet loved. We are separated from our creator, the Bible says. Sin is a word he uses to talk about that separation. A rejection of God, a rebellion of God. Us being part away from him. But like in these stories, the Bible said, he searches like a good shepherd. Like the father waiting. And he absolutely rejoices every time a person is found. And do you know what I love about this? It's not because of what they do. It's not because of what they have. The prostitute on the street corner and the CEO who's part of Parliament is lost yet loved. And God searches and rejoices every time they are found. The person who plays international rugby or the person who plays for Morriston Seconds is lost yet loved. And the person who has a lot of money and the person who has nothing, the impressive job or maybe the not so impressive job who attends church, who maybe really contributes and leads the church, are all people equally made, differently gifted, and the Bible says lost yet loved. Mm -hmm. We see what's amazing about the Bible, it says, although we are lost yet loved, that we are so worth dying for, so worth finding. If you ever question your value, because society has shaped you to think you've got no worth, or no value, or you're lowly viewed because of what you do or what you have, the Bible actually says you are so valuable and that you're worth finding, that you're worth dying for, that you're worth celebrating over. And God the Creator made this possible by coming, stretched his arms out on a cross, and died for all humanity that was lost yet loved. So how should we view and value others in light of this? Well, as we should view and value ourselves, lost yet loved, and in need of a relationship with God. The Bible says Jesus came to seek and save the lost. All humanity, because all are equal. So culture will shape us to tell us, actually, not all people are equal. But the Bible will tell us, yes, they are. Because they are created for purpose, created for meaning. And regardless of what you do, regardless of what you have, who you know, God searches for you, he waits for you. And every time a relationship is restored with God, he absolutely parties over that fact. So may that be an encouragement to us today, um, to everyone of us, and to those you come across. And when them questions come up, don't worry about what your response is, because your value is not found in what you do or you have, it's found in who God says you are, and that's the end.